Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Miller, and the SCP we're going to be looking at today is SCP-1762. Object class, neutralized, previously safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-1762-1 is held in a standard containment unit at site. During the periods when SCP-1762-1 releases SCP-1762-2, video logs are to be recorded for future research. Although instances of SCP-1762-2 have been deemed harmless, they should not be allowed to exit their containment unit. Description SCP-1762-1 is a plain cardboard box that is 32 by 20 by 26 centimeters. It is spray-painted silver on the interior and exterior, and the words, Here Be Dragons, are handwritten in black permanent marker on the lid of the container. Opening the lid of SCP-1762-1 when it is not in the process of a release reveals it to be empty. SCP-1762-1 will infrequently open and initiate a release of SCP-1762-2. During this time, the box will briefly emit a large amount of black smoke that quickly dissipates. It takes an average of 20 seconds for SCP-1762-2 to emerge after the smoke clears. SCP-1762-2 is the collective term applied to the beings that emerge from SCP-1762-1. All instances of SCP-1762-2 bear resemblance to various types of dragons in both eastern and western depictions, albeit in similar forms to that of origami models. Analysis of SCP-1762-2 reveals that they are composed of kami paper. After exiting SCP-1762-1, instances of SCP-1762-2 will fly together in large groups and interact playfully with any nearby personnel and each other. SCP-1762-2 vary in length from 9 to 30 centimeters and are capable of sustained flight once they exit SCP-1762-1, and have been recorded attaining speeds of 15 kilometers per hour. The number of SCP-1762-2 varies with each opening of SCP-1762-1, with numbers ranging from 50 to over 400. After approximately two to three hours of time spent outside of SCP-1762-1, all instances of SCP-1762-2 return and fly back into SCP-1762-1. During this time, SCP-1762-1 will once again begin emitting smoke, and instances of SCP-1762-2 will vanish after passing the rim of SCP-1762-1. SCP-1762-1 closes once all SCP-1762-2 have returned to it. The next date of release is inconsistent. A message, written or carved into a varying material, will sometimes materialize on top of SCP-1762-1's lid once the box retrieves all instances of SCP-1762-2. Attempts to send a message or recording device back with SCP-1762-2 have provided negative results. These documents and their appropriate dates of appearance are being compiled and recorded. Addendum 1762-1 On 2000, SCP-1762-1 began to undergo a series of events that lasted 11 months and 28 days. These events, as well as prior incidents that led up to the beginning of the scenario, have now been classified under the title, The Jabberwocky Event. Addendum 1762-02 Documentation of the Jabberwocky Event Document 1762-1 Date obtained 2004 This is the first recorded instance of SCP-1762-1 opening while contained in sight. You have found us. Thank you. It has been so long since we last saw each other, friends. The peace has been upheld. 
The giants and behemoths have kept their word and have not caused any trouble since you last came and gave the order. We missed your company. How has your family been? Do you still know how to work your room? You are welcome to visit any time. Document 1762-4. Date obtained, 2004. It's strange to see how much your world has changed. It is even stranger to see how we appear in this place. In fantasy, we are much bigger. Or maybe you have grown taller. Fantasy is still the same. We hope you can visit us like you used to. Though our room is as grand as ever, it appears yours has... shrunken? We do not understand. The rooms were supposed to be maintained, as was our agreement. Please restore the belief. Document 1762-6. Date obtained, 2005. Only 20 instances of SCP-1762-2 appeared during this event. Said instances did not lift off, and instead walked slowly on foot for the whole period they were out of SCP-1762-1. Friends, we apologize for our few numbers. We have had to remain in fantasy for quite some time. The others are growing impatient. We are trying to keep the peace, but please, for all of our happiness, repair the room quickly. We know you are trying. Your family is the most imaginative of us all. Document 1762-14. Date obtained, 2000. Along with 10 instances of SCP-1762-2 appearing, Three balls of yellow, crumpled construction paper were expelled from SCP-1762-1. These pieces were observed to shake violently for five seconds, then ceased all further movement. They were picked up by SCP-1762-2 and returned to SCP-1762-1. The giants were foolish. Your room was not ready to accept them yet. We're sorry, friends. We hope that we can still see you, but time is growing short for our happiness. Document 1762-15. Date obtained, 2000. Five instances of SCP-1762-2 emerged, carrying said document. They immediately returned to SCP-1762-1 after depositing it on the floor. Tensions are rising. Fantasy is becoming darker. We, the serpents, and the hybrids are furiously trying to hold them back, but the giants and elves wish to strike and make an entrance. They say that your family has grown stupid and ignorant. We hope this untrue. It would sadden us all greatly to know that you have forgot. Document 1762-16 Date obtained, 2000. A single red instance of SCP-1762-2 emerged from SCP-1762-1. Its wings were torn and it was noticeably crumpled. It collapsed onto the floor one minute later and did not move again. Upon its expiration, the body of SCP-1762-2 rapidly unfolded and revealed a message written on the white side of the paper. Goodbye, friends. Two hours later, SCP-1762-1 opened and emitted flames that reached 2 meters in height, and temperatures of over 1,700 degrees Celsius. Sounds of distant roaring were heard from within SCP-1762-1. At 20 hundred hours, a large amount of torn paper pieces and paper balls were ejected from SCP-1762-1. Several damaged SCP-1762-2 were also expelled and were deemed deceased upon examination. SCP-1762-1 continued to sporadically open and close for the next six weeks. During this time, 
It continued to emit fire as the amount of paper discharged from it steadily decreased. Matter resembling muscle and tissue was continuously expelled from SCP-1762-1 at increasing frequency. SCP-1762-1 remained closed and inactive for the next seven months. Document 1762-17 Date obtained 2000 This document was discovered lying inside the interior of SCP-1762-1. It was written on parchment, and many of the words had been blurred or stained with blood. Are you still out there? Friends, we miss you dearly. Fantasy is no longer safe. Our haven, your beautiful creation, is gone. The giants are dead. The centaurs are dead. The birds have fled. We are going to bury your room. We cannot risk hurting you. This is our goodbye. Maybe one day, your family can build another room. This may be a hollow hope, but we will cherish this thought. One hour later, SCP-1762-1 began to shake and emit smoke for 15 minutes, after which it began to sag and collapse. Several portions of the box began to char and tear, creating small burn holes throughout. The words, here be dragons, on the lid of the box were burned away. Document 1762-18 Date obtained 2000 This is the final message obtained from SCP-1762-1. It was written in ink on a papyrus scroll, and also depicted a scene of a painted mountainous landscape filled with large trees and waterfalls. A single winged dragon can be seen in the background. It appears to be flying away. The message is written in black ink in the bottom right-hand corner. Master says that we won't see you again. We are sad. So are the remaining others. We once filled each other's heads with dreams and goals. It's so sad that we cannot share them any longer. Master says we have to go. He says that he will make us a new fantasy. He says you cannot be part of it. We are sad. We love you. We will not forget you. We are scared. Will you forget us? Upon removal of document 1762-18, Salt water began to leak from SCP-1762-1, and the burn marks that covered the container began to disappear. Three minutes later, SCP-1762-1 had been restored to its original state. The words, Here be dragons, were replaced with the words, Here were dragons. The Jabberwocky event is declared concluded with this occurrence. Addendum 3 since the end of the Jabberwocky event, SCP-1762-1 has shown no further anomalous properties and has been declared neutralized. SCP-1762-1 and three deceased instances of SCP-1762-2 now reside in researcher Yoshihiro Takanaka's office for commemorative purposes. Addendum 1762-4 Update December 31st 2015. After nearly eight years of inactivity, researcher Takanaka reported SCP-1762-1 began emitting purple smoke and spontaneously opened at 2300 hours, falling to the floor. It dislodged a single chunk of crystal, later identified as amethyst, and a large leather-bound book. The contents of this book appear to detail various specimens that once lived within the world of SCP-1762-2, though from what the author has written, all organisms mentioned are likely extinct. This book is now classified as SCP-1762-BOL-1. The amethyst crystal had the following words carved into it. 
one last time. After falling, SCP-1762-1 continuously emitted smoke for the next 40 minutes, before ceasing all activity. Upon trying to pick up SCP-1762-1, Takanaka reported that the box proceeded to disintegrate upon touching it. Its remains are now kept in a containment capsule in his office. So it turns out, I actually have the book right here. I'm guessing you all want to know what's inside it. Now, this book is classified as CP-1762 BOL-1. Well, BOL is an acronym for Beasts of the Old Letters. Let's explore it, shall we? You hold in your hands the paper keys. The keys that can unlock fantasy. When I first discovered this wondrous land, I could scarcely believe everything before me. The spiraling and floating mountains that reached so high that the rings of clouds were still below them. The great waterfalls that sprayed down from the ancient rivers that flowed through forests with trees wise and full of knowledge. The oceans with their golden beaches and cool, lapping waves that never roared nor stormed. And the life within, such unique and wonderful creatures that walk through this fantastic world. It took years for me to gaze upon them all. Who knows? I may have had more to see. I can't see them anymore, though. The land is now barren and cold. So empty and sad, that even the icy ridge that lines the northern forests would offer more warmth. Everything has vanished. All the wonder, gone. All the vibrant and amazing things this world once had to offer, disappeared. I still wonder where they went. I doubt I will ever know. All I do know is that I have my books, my stories, and the memories that are already beginning to fade away as I grow aged and alone in an old man's mind that still believes a long last fantasy may return. I don't think I'll live to see them come back, but I leave these stories to whomever finds them so that they can know that they did exist. Beasts of the Old Letters Alifox when dawn shines through the trees of the soft needle forest, you can find the alifox humming through the giant lilies for a morning meal. A beautiful two-headed bird, slightly larger than a full-grown man, with downy rainbow feathers that quiver ever so slightly as they run through the warm morning breeze. The alifox has four wings that are more akin to an insect's than a bird's, but they blend seamlessly with the back of the creature. They are jeweled and delicate, and they catch the early rays in such a way that they glint and shimmer. The alifox's heads each sport a single large crest, which changes color from one bird to the next. Their eyes are round and a deep purple, their beaks gold and slender, and their cries. The cry of an alifox is sublime, a smooth, crisp, and echoing warble. The heads take turns as they call out, one rising, one falling, one rising, one falling. Alifox eggs are pure white until the chick comes close to hatching, during which they will turn vibrant shades of pink, green, blue, and gold. The chick is no larger than a hand, and like any other infant bird, naked and blind for a few weeks. The first coat of down is white as well, but as it grows older, colors will show through layer upon layer, until a full array of hues coats the bird. I had the great privilege of seeing an alifox nest myself, after many years of exploring the soft needle forest. Before, I had to rely on the records and drawings from the dragons. They are built on the ground, nearly as wide as a dinner table, interlaced with the branches of the thorny ivy to keep predators away from the chicks. The interior is matted with tufts from down the berry bushes. Indeed, the berries themselves are brought back to feed the young too. 
Of course, I could only marvel a few precious minutes before the parents returned, and proceeded to fiercely chase me away for a good quarter of a mile before they returned back to their eggs. Nonetheless, I felt a great deal of happiness, knowing I had witnessed such a rare sight with my own eyes. Bump goals. An enigmatic, and dare I say frightening creature, the Bumpkel is. The dragons themselves say they do not know how or when the Bumpkels arrived in the Black Rock forests to the north, but they have lurked within those rugged trees for centuries now. I dared not to travel into the Black Rock forests alone. That place crawls with the animals of the night and is a place of mystery and fear. The good wizard, Garen, and the dragon, Darwinth, accompanied me all the way. I am forever grateful for their willingness and courage. As the Black Rock Forest loomed nearer, I began to remember tales of bumpkill encounters. Some poor brave soul who went exploring alone when the ashen trail was not yet made. What dreadful and terrifying experiences they must have been. Half a mile into the trees, and the sunlight was already almost completely blocked out. We relied on the soft glow of the carpet moss and ringed mushrooms. The mosquitoes were vicious to the wizard and I. Another fifteen minutes of walking, and we saw our first bumpkel. Or to put it more accurately, bumpkels. Five of them, all hunched over as they crooned over a carcass. From the dim glow of plant life, I could see the muzzle of what may have been a wattle grunt. All of us halted, afraid to disturb the creatures. Easily thirty, even forty feet tall. A single clawed bird-like foot and leg that rose all the way without any other limb or torso until it connected with the head. A giant rounded thing covered in thick matted down. Their two enormous eyes that shone like moons, casting light onto the dead wattle grunt and illuminating the dead creature more than I would care to see. They say the eyes of a bumpkel hypnotize and put the unfortunate gazer into a state of shock and terror. Had we not immediately frozen, they may have turned to us as well. A bumpkel has two mouths, one giant seam hidden beneath its hairy head, filled with thin needle-like teeth. The other is underneath its foot, the toes acting as teeth that clamp and fasten onto flesh as the inner ring of jaws greedily bites off bits of flesh. The sound that the bumpkels were making was atrocious. We stood there silently for the next half hour. By the time the bumpkels began retreating back into the dark, the wattle grunt was unrecognizable. A pile of cracked bones and entrails. The dropper flies began falling from the branches of the trees above to pick at the few remains. We followed the ashen trail back into the clear where a flood of relief greeted us. I would not return to the Black Rock Forest again for years. Charm Changers More akin to a spirit than an animal, Charm Changers nonetheless have a special place in the fantastic lands and so I have included them in this book. With their intense curiosity and near limitless variety, charm changers can be found in any place so long as magic exists there. In their base form, they resemble wisps of pink, yellow, and orange light. Sometimes looking like a human child, sometimes no more than an amorphous blob with two round eyes. They are very pure beings and have an intense attraction towards materials used in spellcasting, with a particular regard for books and scrolls. As such, charm changers have been revered as guardians of magic shops, libraries, and rune spots alike. Visitors and creators of such places would be wise to leave a small offering of some sort to the charm changers, usually consisting of a story, a carving, or a rune stone. Charm changers will take such offerings and turn them into a vessel for themselves, thereby adding the offering's magical power to its own, and providing itself better protection for an otherwise delicate body. Those who keep charm changers happy are blessed with prosperity. Once appeased, 
Charm changers are more than happy to assist those who visit or work in the place they inhabit. However, charm changers can be corrupted with offerings of dark subject matter, as well as being forgotten or neglected. Charm changers that suffer such treatment will become cursed changers and turn otherwise benevolent places into areas of ill fortune and disease. Cursed changers are black, green, and silver as opposed to their lighter counterparts, and once transformed, are impossible to change back. The most tragic incident of charm changers turned cursed occurred at the Library of Knot, where an offering of contaminated elixirs turned nearly 200 charm changers into maddened spirits that began to leak poison into the streets. The dragons were forced to burn down the entire library, incinerating the charm changers, along with hundreds of scripts and books. Drop-Off Dwellers At the edges of the coral flats and bountiful cliffs, where the seaside takes a plunge into cooler waters, pods of drop-off dwellers float and bob lazily in a peaceful slumber. They are shaped like a teardrop that grew immensely swollen on one side, with a small pointed tail that does little in terms of moving its enormous body. Dwellers rely more on the current to move than themselves, going for months at a time without food until drifting back to the fantastic lands. Easily up to 80 feet long, there are two distinct species of dwellers. The dwellers of the coral flats possess distinct growths on their heads, which are actually coral colonies that have fallen and become affixed during feeding times. Coral dwellers are a light blue color with lighter rings dotting their backs. Cliff dwellers are a muddled brown with much more numerous blue spots. Their tails end in a clump of streamer-like skin flaps that ripple and twirl as the dweller moves slowly through the waters. Dwellers come to the fantastic lands once a year, corals during the spring and cliffs in the fall. At the coral flats, dozens of dwellers line side by side at the drop-off's edge, where together they inhale huge amounts of seawater, sucking down the old, dead and leftover remains that accumulated over the winter. When they are done feeding on the debris, the reefs are once again new and ready to begin a new cycle of life. On the bountiful cliffs, dwellers spit out water high into the air at the fruit trees above, freeing hundreds of heavy trees from their burden and into their mouths. Life below also rely on the falling fruit for a final feast before winter comes, when they either must go on a long journey to warm waters or wait it out in hibernation. Regardless of which season, drop-off dwellers play a key role in making sure the coasts of the fantastic lands stay vibrant. The Eskelberg Forest While not as large or dense as the soft needle or black rock forests, the Eskelberg Forest and its singing groves are a popular destination for commoners and explorers alike. Despite its name, the Eskelberg Forest is not actually a forest, and is instead a single, large organism. Each of the trees in the forest is a runner sent up by a large and complex root system which is impeded in Eskelberg Peak. The trunks of these runners are hollowed out, and there are openings to the hollow interior on the tops and sides of the trunks. Air will often funnel in through the top opening and blow out, through the side openings, creating a variety of tones. The leaves on the branches of these trees grow in a curled, funnel-like shape. The constant production of tones by the runners fills the groves with a flowing improvisational melody, providing a pleasant acoustic background for visitors. This constant stream of sound is then funneled into the forest leaves, into the center of the spirals where the air once again enters into the inner workings of the runners. Wood nymphs and scholars who have studied the groves believe that this constant passing back and forth of music between the trees is the forest thinking to itself. Among these, there is a small following which believes the forest is only asleep 
and that the great wood beast will one day awake and rise out of Eskelberg Peak. The unique hollowed out trunks of the Eskelberg Forest provide habitats for numerous small animals, including sizable populations of burnt wuffle and zootru. The forest is also the only location in which the bulb nut squirrels are found naturally. This vibrant ecosystem makes the forest popular among amateur naturalists and seasoned explorers alike. Fire Manes Intensely proud animals, fire manes roam the Jainu Plains in prides ranging from 10 to 15 members. Closely resembling a lion at base, fire manes are also named for the scarlet, iridescent hairs that ring the necks of both the male and female and race down the sides and backs in horizontal stripes. This fur is highly prized as a material for clothing, though there are very strict laws placed on fire mane hunting. However, unlike the lion, fire manes possess two pairs of antlers that rise regally from their heads behind the ears like a stag, and race across the savanna on three pairs of scaly reptilian legs. Fire manes love the thrill of the chase while in pursuit of prey, often purposefully letting the prey go should they catch it too quickly. While some may say this game of catch and release is cruel, it is nonetheless a fascinating spectacle to see as the fire manes become a flaming blur on the grassy fields. While not hunting, they can be seen racing each other, and if approached with caution and presented with respect, other beings such as wizards, elves, and even dragons. A lucky few have been blessed with the fortune of even riding them. A magician I knew named Jang told me his account of riding a fire main he befriended years ago. He said at first he held on for dear life as the beast took off, but as he gained his hold it was an exhilarating and unforgettable experience. As he and the fire main raced through the night sky, they almost looked like a comet flying along the ground. Gyro gliders. A type of newt like creature native to the beaches and cliffs of the southern sea. Gyro gliders are unusual for amphibians because they possess fully functional wings, or something close to them at least. These wings resemble long webbed fins that can open and close like a fan when the gyroglider contracts and relaxes its muscles. There are two pairs stacked directly on top of another, with the bottom set slightly longer. Unlike birds or bats that flap their wings up and down, the gyroglider spins its wings in a circle, the top set turning clockwise and the bottom in reverse. Gyrogliders are thrill seekers, particularly the males. During the mating season in summer, they can be seen taking life risking leaps off the cliff walls to the beach below, performing a multitude of spins and flips on the way down to the beach below. The closer they come to the beach before pulling up to safety, the more attention they get from potential mates. Females can also be seen jumping, though they prefer to glide and loop as opposed to the male's chaotic, flamboyant routine. When not performing daredevil jumps, they spend most of their time clinging to the beach cliffs, or within the many holes and cracks of the rock. These creatures come in a stunning array of colors, ranging from turquoise and white, to pink and gold, to silver and green. It is common for gyrogliders to mate with one that does not possess their own color scheme. This practice continues to produce wide arrays of different shades and color combinations. Gyrogliders lay their eggs in treacherous waters full of hidden rocks and boulders, thereby discouraging predators from making a meal. Their eggs are round and numerous like a fish's and coated with an adhesive that anchors the eggs to the rocks. The young hatch within 30 days and will spend the first few weeks of their life in the water until their wings develop. Afterwards, they will spin and loop up to the rest of the colony, ready to become the next generation of daredevil jumpers. Hopserve hoppers. A charming and oddly entertaining species. 
Observoppers were created by the Flu Elves about a hundred years ago, using an array of housework and cooking spells. The Observopper's goal? To prepare and serve delicious food wherever and whenever a banquet is held. The Observopper resembles a large white egg with a single colored dot in the center of their faces that superficially looks like a simple eye, usually blue or green when the Observopper is not preparing food. This dot will change color depending on how near a meal the creature is preparing is to completion. When the circle turns red or pink, the food is ready to serve. What makes the Observopper so intriguing is that they prepare the food inside their bodies with the help of the magic given to them by the flu during their creation. When Observoppers have finished making food, they crack open to reveal the meal inside, which can range from steaming piles of meat and delicious bowls of soups to beautifully arranged fruits and desserts. Once the food is taken, the Observopper closes again without any harm and goes back to preparing food as needed until a feast is done. Observoppers move around on a single human-like foot that is the same white as their egg body. If in the middle of making a meal, it is not uncommon to hear the Observopper present humming a soft, cheery tune as they open and close. It is also not uncommon to hear the sounds of jostling metal coming from inside them as they move to and fro. It almost sounds like Observoppers carry a multitude of cooking supplies and utensils inside them. However, not even the flu elves know what goes on inside a Observopper's body, though given the deliciousness of the end product, the Observopper's magic is a treat for anyone who is invited to a flu banquet. Eeyore. As a certified zoologist, it's my job to venture into any and all regions in the fantastic lands to discover new species. One of the more perilous journeys took me to the Kupri Icelands, a flat stretch of snow that is deceptively deep. There are countless legends of a whole world living below this snowfall, tales of things such as ice elves and ancient monsters that have been hibernating for centuries. Such legends are an enticing incentive for people such as myself to explore, and although travel parties have never discovered the beings spoken of in the fables, we have discovered more than 20 new animal species hidden in the ice. From the shy and plump pluners that huddle in the hundreds to conserve body heat, to the snow lances that lie in waiting to spear unfortunate prey with their icicle-tipped horns. And in all these travels, we relied on the hardiness and warmth of the Eeyore to make sure we wouldn't freeze to death on our journeys. The Eeyore are a group of beasts that have been domesticated by the Kupri villagers for decades. Eeyore are incredibly docile, at most grunting softly when annoyed, and perhaps kicking a shower of snow at someone. Somehow I think the sight of seeing someone bewildered as they are covered from head to toe in snow amuses the beasts. If one does such an act, Others nearby will rumble together in a chorus that sounds almost like laughter. Eeyores walk on four legs, arranged like a cross that are as thick as tree trunks, with strong flat feet that allow them to walk across the deep snow without sinking. Their heads are small relative to the rest of their bodies and is reminiscent of a turtle. Large folds of fat that are surprisingly warm line the Eeyore's back and store the necessary sustenance for the animal in times when food is scarce. However, the most fascinating parts of the Eeyore are the large, multiple fin-like growths that ring the sides of the fat folds. Made of hollow bone at the base, these fins are transparent and shine an iridescent white during the short times of sunlight in the Kupri Icelands. In just a few hours of sun, these growths can absorb and retain an astounding amount of heat for the cold nights. Whenever we would camp, the Eeyore would spread these growths like a fan. The fins would glow red with the warmth and calm of a comforting fire. And no matter the frigid temperatures around us, with the Eeyore, we would always sleep peacefully. Jorthwax Jorthwax have long been used by the various diminutive races of the fantastic lands for transport, racing, 
and beasts of burden. In at least one of the pixie societies in the Midlands, a pixie's wealth can be determined by the size and quality of their herd. Even the largest Jorthwack that I have seen was small enough to fit in my hand, the perfect proportion for most of their masters. In terms of their head and body shape, their appearance is similar to a cross between a horse and an antelope. Out of the head grows a pair of relatively large, curled branching antlers. Each Jorthwack possesses six legs, very similar to those of a cricket, which they use for leaping. Jorthwax come in a variety of vibrant colors, mostly pinkish red and green, but blue and gold varieties also exist, though these are more commonly reserved for knights and royalty. One of the historical accounts including Jorthwax that I find most interesting is the Battle of Kur. For several years, a war had been raging, as the Mabish sprites attempted to drive the invading Kurish gnomes out of their territories. The wizard clan granted the sprites a boon by increasing their size so that they might fight on equal footing with their gnomish forces. However, during their change, the sprites Jorthwax also increased in size. After overrunning the gnomish forces on the field of battle, the sprites were able to use the newfound leaping strength of their Jorthwax to breach the gnomes' secluded mountain stronghold of Kur, forcing peace and bringing the gnomes under their rule. Kirifer Door Shards Approximately 200 years ago, in the Second Dwarven Empire of the North, King Kurthic IV commissioned a massive treasury to be constructed within Mount Kirifer in order to house the kingdom's supply of gold. On the southeastern face of the mountain, an enormous door to the treasury was placed in the cliff face. This door was enchanted to only recognize and allow members of the royal court into the treasury. Unfortunately, King Kurthic and his builder had not anticipated the battering rams and catapults of the northern giants. While the Kirifer door was shattered, its many fragments retained parts of its enchantment. Each shard took on its own personality and name. The shards are capable of projecting their thoughts into the mind of their holder, usually in the form of images, songs, tales, and conversation. The shards can also communicate with each other if they are in close enough proximity, and two holders which are close enough together can hold a conversation of thoughts through their shards. Following the breaking of the door, the Kirifer shards were collected and dispersed throughout the fantastic lands. In many places, they were cut, polished, and sold as exotic jewelry. In other places, the shards were treasured for their eccentric and curious personalities, and were used by artists as muses of inspiration. I myself carried a Kirifer shard companion named Hathid with me on a necklace for several years. The Lightning Struck Titan It is a mercy to all of the fantastic lands that the Lightning Struck Titan only awakens with the passing of Vamaroth's storm every 300 years in the southern jagged mountains of Kor. The beast resembles a beetle or hermit crab with a dragon's head, covered in a goliath pyramid of stone and dirt that accumulates over its 300-year slumbers. A huge, crumbling, spiraling tower resides on its back, built by the same sorcerer whom the storm that awakens the beast is named after. Vamaroth came to the Fantastic Lands 2,000 years ago in a search to build a place where he could practice and perfect his art of weather spells. The jagged mountains proved ideal to him, with their isolation and formidable appearance. He began to construct his tower at the plateau of the highest mountain he could find. It would take him 15 years to complete. As soon as the final brick was placed, he began to call forth a thunderstorm more powerful than any the mountains had seen. The lightning surged from the spire of Vamaroth's tower to the base and below, each strike stirring the beast he had built his tower upon. With earth-shaking might, the titan stretched its legs and rose. A thousand-foot Goliath that bellowed as the storm caused it pain while at the same time restoring it to life. The lightning-struck titan began to move once more, 
eating huge chunks of earth and stone from the cliffsides with its toothed maw. And all the while, the storm raged above its back. Following the Titan, as it lumbered through the jagged mountains, Vomarov himself perished as his tower collapsed with each step the giant took. The dragons sought at once to try and stop the beast, or at the very least, impede it. But the Titan was impervious to all magic. It was an ancient, long-forgotten creature, a force of nature, and it seemed its rampage would destroy all of the fantastic lands. Finally, a group of mages, led by the sorceress named Talia, arrived. They cast a spell that created the great winds to drive the storm away from the lightning-struck titan, and the beast began to slow as the energy gained from the storm disappeared. It managed to return to its resting place before falling asleep once again, and the lands it raised fell silent. Talia and her group were hailed as heroes, and they turned their efforts to restoring the damage done by the Titan. Afterwards, they would guard the jagged mountains until their deaths, continuing to strengthen the enchantment that kept Vomarov's storm and the lightning-struck Titan apart. However, the two are bound to meet again. Vomarov's storm returns every 300 years from its banishment in the Howling Sands to reawaken the beast below. The last time the Titan awoke was 187 years ago. I fear the day when we must again prepare for the worst. Monoliths to Heaven In the flat southeastern plains of Jainu, a group of creatures live in a group that grows by a mere one member at the beginning of each year. The Monoliths to Heaven Each monolith is less flesh and more stone. Made of obsidian, they are shaped like a rugged ellipse, with a singular large hole running through the top portion like a downward staring eye. Two spindly legs jut out and then fall to the ground from the center of the monolith. Legs that look like they would never be able to support a creature of a monolith's mass. However, the monolith's deep magical ties with the stars allow them to stand for the long walk they must undertake every new year. Monoliths travel between two locations and two locations only. One is the site of a meteor, a crater that spans a thousand feet wide. The other is a tomb for Jiang the Magician, the monolith's creator. Known for his near eccentric obsession with the stars, Jiang frequently ventured to the Jainu Plains with stargazing gear, constantly looking for what he claimed to be the heavenly planet. Such a planet is vaguely described in old Jainu texts, but only as folktale, a legend. However, until his dying breath, Jiang believed the heavenly planet to be more than just a myth, and so created the monoliths to carry out his work when he himself could no longer achieve his dream. Until the week before the new year, the monoliths remained buried in a ring around Jiang's tomb. During this time, the holes in their bodies create various patterns as the sun rises and sets. Once Eve falls on the week before the new year, the monoliths rise from their slumber one by one, and it is during this time that one can see Jiang's determination to ascend to the heavenly planet. The tallest current monolith towers a staggering 600 feet in the air. Each following monolith is 50 feet shorter for a total of a dozen. As the sky darkens, the monoliths begin a slow 50-mile walk to the crater site, with only starlight to guide them. As they walk in descending order, they almost look like the stairs of a giant's castle. On the dawn of the new year, when they have gathered in the center of the crater, the birth of a new monolith begins. Still in their descending order, the light of the new sun shines through the holes of the monoliths to the ground, illuminating the spot where a new member will rise from the ground, born from the fragments of the meteor that struck the fantastic lands 2,000 years ago. This new member will become the new tallest monolith, the next stepping stone to Jiang's fabled world. Once the new monolith takes its place at the front of the line, 
the stone giants begin their walk back to the grave of their master, where they bury themselves once again, until the next year. Note, people. In all my travels through this fantastic world, the note people that live in the eastern plains of Darius stand out as the most unique and wondrous creatures. Living Music Created 200 years ago, when a sorceress called Eliana sought to create enchanted musical instruments capable of producing the most beautiful sounds ever heard. Instead, she created the note people. As the spell intended to make a symphony progressed, the ink and notes inscribed on the enchantment papers, quite literally, flew off the parchment and began to coalesce in a swirl of sound and symbols. They took on the shape of their creator, creating the first Note Woman. Eliana would grow old, but the Note Woman continued to stay with her, forever playing music when her creator desired it. Eliana would create dozens more of its kind before she died at an age of 152 years. The Note People themselves would carry her body away into the plains they now inhabit. The sound that the harp reeds and grasses make while blowing in the wind, greatly appeals to their kind. The note people today are just as, if not more, talented in magic and music. They delight in having visitors to entertain, oftentimes taking whoever comes across them by hand and bringing them to its friends. It is rather odd to be touched by a note man. The notes and lines that make up their bodies are nearly flat, working together to make a three-dimensional form. Yet they feel cool, almost like thin, delicate paper. They can shift their bodies into whatever form they please. I've even seen note people exchange and mix their music to produce sounds that they could not accomplish on their own. Note people have a special affinity for starlight moths that provide lights to the planes in the night. Being inky black themselves, note people will often try to capture the starlight moths within their bodies to make them visible for nightly performances. It was during such a performance that I was able to witness the note people for the first time on a warm summer evening, with the harp reeds and grass humming softly along with the music of the note people. It will be an experience I will never forget. Ocean Sippers It was while visiting to the fishing ports of the south that I learned of the wondrous ocean sippers. The suntanned fishermen I spoke to had encountered them almost daily on their voyages, and had collected several objects of study. Among these were several sketches, pellets, and even an injured specimen that they had taken on board. At first glance, a sipper looks to be some kind of large iridescent bird, similar in appearance to a pigeon. On closer inspection, however, it becomes apparent that, in place of feathers, the creature is covered in a material with a blend of traits of feathers and scales. Like scales, pieces of the material have the texture of the scales of a fish and are firmly connected to the body. However, the shape of the pieces are more similar to the feathers one would see in any other seabird and even resemble down in some places. Sippers are capable of breathing in both air and fresh water, and spend most of their time as part of a flock in a large bubble of water which drifts high above the iridescent sea. This bubble follows the course of schools of small fish or prawns. At night, the sippers dive from their bubble to the surface of the ocean, where they skim off and swallow a layer of prey in seawater before returning to their abode. The combination of seawater and food is then processed in their guts until they regurgitate it as fresh water and a small pellet composed of salt and the remains of their prey. The water is added to their bubble to compensate for evaporation. While the pellet is tossed down toward the ocean below, fishermen will often collect the pellets either for their supply of iridescent salt or in order to sell them to tourists at the ports. Polydanes among some of the most curious forms of life in the fantastic lands are the polydanes. Polydanes can be found all throughout the world, 
though they are especially concentrated in western cities and in places populated by large groups of other races. In their true forms, Polydanes are roughly the same size and shape as a human, but they have a second set of arms and a blank, smoothed-over face. Their bodies appeared to be composed of various colors of clay in a marbled pattern. Polydanes are able to stretch and mold and reshape their bodies at will, and can take on the properties of other materials, such as stone or flesh. On occasion, Polydanes will take the form of an inanimate object, though more often they emulate another race before mingling with other members of that race. At other times, Polydanes will take whimsical or nonsensical forms for their own or others' amusement. Polydanes are capable of reproduction in two ways. The first is through reproduction with another individual, Polydane or otherwise. And the second is through a single Polydane individual dividing into two distinct individuals. In addition, Polydane's bodies do not age naturally, and damage from physical attacks against them is not lasting. In most cases, a species which can multiply without aging or being killed would overtake and crowd their environment, but such is not the case for Polydanes. Though their bodies are long-lived and impervious, their spirits will still age, and often pass on after a hundred years or so. Once their spirit is gone, the Polydanes' body will revert to its natural clay form and will begin to dry, dying completely once it's fully dry. If a sapient individual encounters the body before it's fully dry, they can will their consciousness into the empty husk, leaving their older form behind and beginning their life anew as a polydane. Quirblers There is still much debate over the nature of quirblers. Some profess that they are collections of very communal spirits, others claim that they are merely a novel of variation of atomite. Quirblers are often found in the various woods of the northern cliffs. From a distance, they appear as shimmering patterns along the surface of trees. However, should a traveler pass by them, the quirbler will remove themselves from the tree and appear in front of the traveler as a swirling pillar of light. The quirbler will refuse to move out of the way until the traveler has beaten them in some challenge, usually in the form of a riddle or a game of chance. Should the traveler win this challenge, the quirbler will allow them to travel on. Should the traveler fail, however, the quirbler will enter through the traveler's mouth and take command of the traveler. The quirbler possessed individual will then make their way back to a village, town, or city where they will take part in feasts, festivals, and other merriments. Individuals who are possessed by quirblers can be identified by both their eccentric and celebratory behavior and by the swirls of light that can be seen in their eyes. Quirblers may leave of their own accord after celebrating for a few days, but they can also be coaxed out by placing meats, cheeses, tarts, and spiced wine just out of reach of a possessed individual. Individuals who have been possessed by a quirbler are often no worse for the wear, aside from exhaustion and embarrassing stories accumulated from their excessive partying. Nearly 40 years ago, one possessed individual led a large group of quirblers to the northern village of Oaken. It took a full two weeks for the dragons to get word of the news and sort out the affected citizenry. However glad the citizens were to have their wits back about them, they did miss the merriment that the quirblers had brought them. This, paired with the fact that the quirblers meant no ill will and had only been searching for a place to escape the cold of the woods, led to the creation of a yearly holiday in Oaken and the surrounding villages, wherein the villages are open for a full week to the quirblers, so that they and the villagers may celebrate to their heart's content. Ruyablorts Partially named for the distinct, deep bubbling they periodically make to sustain their levels of buoyancy, Ruyablorts are immense jellyfish-like creatures used by merfolk throughout the fantastic lands in constructing their undersea homes. Anywhere from 1 to 500 feet in diameter at the bell, 
Ruyablorts may look like jellyfish, apart from the large, simple, almost horse-like head that matches the same transparency and jelly-like state as the rest of the body. But unlike jellyfish, their tentacles do not contain any poisons and are actually more or less vestigial growths. Ruyablorts are primarily filter feeders and are to some extent photosynthetic. The bell is an enormous air sac that keeps the Ruyablort suspended in the water. Air is taken in and released through a circle of small tubes near the base of the bell. At night, they glow through a soft cycle of translucent turquoise, pink, and green. Merfolk are well known for their pickiness when it comes to decorations, always wanting to find a balance between structure and aesthetics. To complement the calming iridescence of the Ruyablort's back, the merfolk take such items as discarded abalone shells, glass corals, and pearl sponges as building materials, constructing beautifully elegant towers. As they continue to build and live on the Ruyablort's backs, the Ruyablort's get to eat any scraps that float off the Mercities. Depending on the clan and location, Ruyablort cities can have anywhere from 10 to over 40 of the gentle giants floating together. With the right spells, land dwellers can journey with the merfolk under the sea and enter an almost otherworldly realm of soft rainbow light as fish, whales, and merfolk alike swim around and within the Ruyablort metropolis. Sun Stealers Years after the close brush with the Bumkles, I would make three more ventures into the Black Rock Forest. However, on the fourth journey, I was in search of one creature in particular, the fabled beings known as Sun Stealers, said to be tall as the trees themselves and black and cold as a starless night. Heavens know why I would actually want to intentionally go looking for them. The dragons once again sent help with me, this time with a young sapphire dragonling named Tyria and a wise steelback named Jarnadi. Before leaving, Garin ran up to us with a last-minute gift as well, a potion that would turn us dark as the Black Rock Forest, so that the creatures hiding within could not spy us as we invaded their home. Garin himself would not dare accompany us again. I do not think any less of him for doing so. The trip to the Black Rock Forest felt different this time. Colder, like the creatures expected our return, and were gleefully waiting to strike as soon as we stepped foot into their lair. I suspected it was just nerves, though as we passed through the rugged lane, I could not help but begin to have second thoughts about coming back. As the first black rock shrubs came into view, and the new moon cast darkness onto the ground, Tyria, Jarnati, and I took out Garin's gift, and each took a drink from the bottle. It was like having a barrel of water from the glaciers of the ridge forced down your throat. But when the chills passed, we could tell Garin's work had been done. We were all still able to see each other, but each of us looked like a reflection in slowly rippling water. A camouflage to shield us from whatever lurked in the trees. We steadied our minds and once again went into the Ashen Trail. Sun Stealers were said to live deep within the Black Rock trees, where the air itself feels like floating pitch and the slightest sound echoes like the crackling of a thousand bones. We journeyed for what I think was two days. All the while, the ashen trail grew less and less pronounced, and the darkness became overwhelming. More than once, Jarnati suggested we concede and turn back, but I was stubborn, and Tyria was eager for adventure. We pushed on. On the fifth day, Jarnati spotted something. A patch of darkness even more ominous than the surrounding black. A darkness that rippled and seemed to ripple and churn. I knew at once we had found a sun stealer grove. It was well off the ashen trail, though we knew that we must step off the path. Tyria was the first to go forward. I am slightly ashamed to say I was the third. The chill grew frigid as we came closer. The silence all-consuming but we still pressed on. After moving a mere twenty paces, we were soaked with sweat. Near collapse. But we made it, 
and we waited to gaze upon a sun-stealer with a mix of terror and excitement. None came. We waited for hours, and the creatures never appeared. It was maddening. Time slipped away. On the third day, Jarnati finally told us to go back, and with hearts heavy, provisions low, and minds fogging, we relented. And as we neared the clearing back into the rugged paths, the sun stealers appeared. The old scriptures were true. Tall as the trees, like a shroud woven from a black sky, a smooth white depression for a face, two black expressionless eyes that looked on us like a child about to curiously crush an insect, an ebony crown that floated above their heads with long slender points, and above the crown, an orb that looked like a star, an orb that made me realize why the sun stealers were so aptly named. The crown seemed to suck light from the circle, the glow changing from white to gray to black as it reached the crown's base. But it didn't end with the stars within their crowns. What little light that snuck through the trees was dragged to them as well, the black leaves withering as they lost what little sun they could live from, the creatures living within them fleeing or falling dead at the creature's feet. Tyria died. The sun stealers enveloped her in their cloaks, and when they moved away, she was nothing more than a weathered skin. They parted, as if telling Jarnati and I to leave, as if we had paid the price for their mercy with one life. We stumbled away, and when I looked back, they were gone. The ashen trail was overrun with new black rock plants, as if it had never existed. That was my fourth and final visit to the forest. Without the ashen trail, the dragons themselves have refused to go back. Trimblewise Trimblewise are among the most numerous creatures in all of fantasy, and with good reason. They are able to thrive in nearly any environment where there is food. Outwardly, Trimblewise begin their life with an appearance similar to that of a mouse, though without a noticeable tail and much more rotund. They have white coats of fur and ruby eyes. As a Trimblewise carries on through its life, its development is shaped by the food it eats. The type of food that the Trimblewise eats will cause changes in its size, shape, coat, and even occasionally the limbs it possesses. Just as the type of food that the Trimblewise eats affects its outward appearance, the quality of the food it eats changes its disposition. High quality food causes the Trimblewise to become tame and domestic while garbage causes it to become vicious and dangerous. For this reason, families will often forego eating the choice portions of their meal in order to appease and train the Trimblewise which may be living in their house. While paying a visit to the court of Florent, I was treated by my host to a pair of curiosities. The Count was in possession of two very unique specimens of Trimblewise, one of which had only ever been fed on gold and a second which had only ever been fed on rose petals. The first had grown in size an appreciable amount, and had a sleek coat of golden coloration, and was much thinner on the front than in the back, giving it a kind of egg shape. The second did not seem to have grown much, if anything it had shrunk. However, its coat had been replaced by brilliant layers of red feathers, and it had a thick tail, similar to a dragon's. Later that night, the Count and I feasted on what I was informed was a Trimblewise which had been raised on a diet of beef, pork, and veal. I found the meal quite to my liking. Yunsen The Yunsen is one of the most elusive creatures in all of fantasy. I fear I have little to report on it, as in spite of all the evidence of its existence, no man, dragon, elf, or dwarf has made clear observation of it. There is even still doubt as to whether the Yunsen is a single beast or an entire species. These unknown elements only add to its intrigue, which is why I have included it in this collection. The Yunsen moves at an extremely rapid pace, which is the main reason it has been able to evade observation or capture for all these years. It seems to know instinctively where its hunters are looking, constantly moving out of sight or hiding behind secluded cover. It never seems to leave behind any hair or scent. 
only its footprints. The trail of prints that the Yunsen leaves are highly unusual and are the only aspect of the creature's existence which can be readily observed. The prints are composed of a single large circle about the size of a deer's hoof, with two smaller circles on the sides of it, and two other circles behind it. Once made, a large jet of steam will rise out of each print, mixing in with the morning mists that are present when the Yunsen is most active. Interestingly, the arrangements of the prints may change over time, and have indicated at different times that the Yunsen has anywhere between 1 and 12 legs. Vinthril The Vinthril are a group of creatures that inhabit the Jagged Valley about three quarters of the way along the trail to the Black Rock Forest, also known as the Winged Bumpkle. The Vinthril does indeed resemble the towering monopedes in the Black Rock Forest with its round hairy head and mouthful of needle-like teeth, but they are in fact entirely different species. Vinthril do not possess feet. Instead, using their large clawed bat-like wings for both flying and climbing through the cliffs of the jagged valley. As it glides, a long tail lined evenly with three to six balls of fur similar to its head trails behind, producing a soft whistling sound as the wind passes through the hairs. Though Vinthril are not above devouring travelers or other animals unfortunate enough to cross them, they are actually predominantly fruit eaters. Specifically, they eat the fruit of the maroon trees that are strong enough to grow on the sides of the cliff faces. The fruit of these trees looks exactly like the head of the vinthril, round and covered in fibers. And so residents of the fantastic lands have taken to calling it vinthril fruit. While not particularly tasty to most in the fantastic lands, to the vinthril, these fruits play an invaluable role in their reproduction. A female vinthril will swoop and snatch a number of fruits off a tree while pregnant, and puncture a single hole in the fruit's hard outer shell. From there, it regurgitates an infant vinthril no bigger than the tip of a finger into the soft innards of the fruit before flying off. The fruit both serves as protection and the food for the juvenile vinthril until it is strong enough to break free. Up until recently, people thought the similar look between the vinthril and the vinthril fruits were just a coincidence. Though now it seems the fruits play a larger role in developing vinthrils than previously thought. While exploring the Jagged Valley, the adventurer Galbion was attacked by a pregnant vinthril and only escaped by throwing his pack of Guya melons behind him, which the vinthril immediately took and deposited eggs inside of before flying off. Galbion Intrigued as to why the Vinthril birthed its young in a non-native fruit stuck close to the Guya melons until the Vinthril hatched. To his, and many other zoologists when he brought the Vinthril back's shock, the creature sported the same bright pink and green coloration as the Guya melons, along with tough spikes lining their bodies instead of the usual hairs. After this discovery, a brief boom in experimental Vinthril breeding occurred with successful births in fruits such as the coconut, pumpkin, and daradara cones. However, people soon realized that these vinthrils suffered from terrible sicknesses as they matured, and died painfully shortly after. Nowadays, to prevent the exploitation of exotic hybrids as well as fear of damaging the natural breeding process, experimental breeding of vinthrils is illegal, and there are several penalties inflicted on anyone who tries to entice a vinthril to birth young in anything other than the vinthril fruit. Watchers of the Waning Moon Once in a while, I will come across a creature that I feel I will never truly be able to understand. The Watchers of the Waning Moon are such a group, shrouded in mystery, and practitioners in a strange and surreal act that even the dragons cannot explain. Watchers live in the brush of the eastern plains, only appearing at night. They have the head and front body of a white stag, with thin, fine antlers adorned with moon lily buds. Some say the antlers are not horns at all, but actual moon lily plants that have sprouted and rooted into their heads. However, due to the Watchers' curious nature, no one has been able to prove one theory or another. The back end of the animal is the tail of a serpent, 
long, smooth-scaled, and pearly. The tip of the tail ends in a single large moon lily, which, like the flowers on the Watcher's antlers, will remain a bud until the moment of the Watcher's death. These creatures are intensely shy, fleeing and vanishing in a cloud of mist should someone spot them. The only time they show themselves is during the time of the waning crescent of the first moon, during which dozens of Watchers will gather at the plains thicket and undertake a ritual unlike any other. When the waning crescent of the first moon is highest in the sky, one watcher from those present will step forward and begin to climb and snake their way up the trees until it rests on top of the leaves. Those below begin to rock and circle in rhythm, their movement along the ground creating strange and perplexing patterns. All the while, they hum a low, bass-like chorus. As the patterns increase in number, the moon lilies on the tail and antlers of the watchers atop the trees will begin to open. Once the lilies are fully bloomed, the watcher will let out a long drawn out cry before pushing off and jumping high into the air. The lilies will begin to release wisps of pollen and the watcher will inexplicably continue to rise like a flying snake for hundreds of feet, continuing to ascend towards the moon. However, as soon as the lily's pollen is spent, the watcher will cease to rise and plummet to the ground. Upon impact, the broken body of the animal will dissolve into a mist, which rises and dissipates into the night sky. All other watchers will appear to sigh and fade, clouding the thicket with the same mist until they all disappear. Afterwards, the only evidence of them ever being present are the strange patterns they drew upon the ground. When I asked the librarian dragons, Parian and Luthana, about the watchers' strange practice, they told me they could only guess. There are several scripts that provide a theory to the Watcher's behavior. Some say that the Watchers believe the Waning Crescent is one of their own, an individual that has attained transcendence in the heavens, and that the creatures on this earth are attempting to join it. Indeed, the Moon Crescent resembles an arching snake. Other scripts believe the opposite, that the creatures see the Moon as a Watcher trapped in the sky, and that in jumping, they are attempting to grab it and bring it back down. Either way, it is a fascinating but thoroughly enigmatic insight into the Watcher of the Waning Moon. Whatever the reason, they show no signs of stopping their ceremony. I wonder if they will ever realize that the moon cannot be caught. Zargarths The Vulin Dwarfs that live within the Steam Caverns, just miles from the ridge, are known for their unmatched talent in metalworking and gem cutting. Indeed. The geothermal caves which they have made their home in are abundant with rare metals and gemstones, and accounts for nearly 40% of all jewelry traded through the fantastic lands. Any piece made by the Vulin is a fine treasure to possess. During their mining in the steam caverns, the Vulin began to notice that carts of gems would return to the surface with fewer stones than originally loaded. Though at first confused, they quickly found a creature mixed in with their gems that was indistinguishable from the stones except when it was feeding. The Zargarths Zargarths start their lives looking similar to stones such as geodes or agates, with their outer skin covered in a sturdy shell that looks exactly like rock. Within this shell is a mismatch of tissue and organs. Zargarths can spout small red tentacles for locomotion. As they move, a row of microscopic teeth scrape minerals and gather organic matter from the steam cavern's floors and walls. As they grow older, Zargarths begin to abandon feeding on organic matter and turn solely to stones for food. Much to the Vulin's dismay, gemstones were the Zargarths' favored treat. After ingesting the crystals, Zargarths incorporate them into their outer shell, where they grow along with the rest of the creature as if they were part of the body itself. The older a Zargarth grows, the deeper it tunnels into the earth to find more bountiful feasts of jewels. Eventually, they resemble giant slug-like creatures covered in countless crystal growths. Dozens of small stubby legs carry the Zargarth's body as it skitters along the ground. Although at first considered a destructive pest to the gem trade, the Vulin have since been domesticating Zargarths as both a pet and a business helper. As it turns out, 
Zargoths shed crystals that grow too large. These discarded gems are collected and sold as they are, or further cut into an array of jewelry. Different Zargoths have different preferences for what jewels they ingest, so the Vulan are sure to keep scouting for further varieties of Zargarth subspecies. During my last visit, I saw magnificent specimens of ruby, opal, and even diamond Zargarths in Vulan care. The good dwarf Lair gave me a beautiful fire opal that had fallen off one of the creatures, which I now carry in my travel bag wherever I go. The Yanyar and the Yanyiris There is a forested ring of islands east of the fantastic lands that has been left largely uncharted due to a species even the dragons shudder to hear mentioned. The Yanyar The Yanyar spread cold and lifelessness wherever they walk, blanching everything around them as they continuously sap vitality. Anything living or inanimate that comes too close to the Yanyar will collapse, grayed and cold, in a matter of seconds. Such behavior has caused the trees, the earth, and even the surrounding sea of their home to turn gray as dust, and so the Yanyar's home is aptly known as the Monochrome Islands. Physically, the Yanyar are tall and lean, like the elves, though they do not wear garments and lack any parts to identify gender, if they so have them. Their skin is the same gray as everything they touch, and their hands and feet both have long, nailless digits that constantly grip and ungrip the chilling fluidity. However, the most distinctive and chilling part of the Yanyar are their faces. A bulbous, smooth head far too large for a body of their thinness, with squinted gray eyes that appear disturbingly human. While normally featureless apart from the eyes, the Yanyar's head will split vertically into thirds to reveal two separate jaws with even, needle-like teeth. During this time, no one can see that the Yanyar's eyes are more akin to a tongue, a sensory organ attached to a fleshy stalk that runs all the way down its throat. It is believed that the Yanyar are blind and rely on these eyes to smell their surroundings, like a serpent tasting the air. The first Yanyar ever seen washed ashore on the beaches of the Fantastic Lands 60 years ago, and it was from this corpse's autopsy that most of the information about this species was obtained. It was easy to see where it had come from, even in death. The Anyar's corpse left a trail of grey in the ocean waves, though said trail was lost after the dragons pursued it for dozens of miles offshore. It would take another 20 years to find the monochrome islands, yet only 6 months for the Dragon Council to declare the area off-limits to all. Most of the Fantastic Land's inhabitants simply believed the Yanyar were too dangerous to go near, and left it at that. I, however, know the deeper meaning behind the monochrome island being sealed from the world. In a different time, I would have probably been imprisoned, maybe even banished from the Fantastic Lands. However, now that my home is all but abandoned, I leave this information to whomever may stumble upon it. The Yanyar corpse we recovered was mutilated, with huge circular punctures throughout the body. Strangely, the wound had no exposed flesh. Instead, a black, empty void filled the gap. When the poor dragon doctor Haridus tried to examine the wounds, the void turned his flesh to pure black. He looked like a living shadow in his final moments. Then, with a cry, Haridus faded out of existence. When the dragons finally discovered the monochrome islands, they found their explanation to the darkness seen on the first Yanyar's body. Beneath the dark waters of the Yanyar's home, lays the Yanyiris, an even more terrifying creature than the beings above. From what the dragons observed, the Yanyiris appeared to be worshipped as a god by the Yanyar. The Yanyar will cast themselves off sheer cliffs of the island to the sea below, where shadowy tentacles rise in the thousands to spear the bodies and drag them below. It is unknown how large the Yanyiris is, though its limbs alone are long enough to effortlessly scale the 2,000-foot cliffs of the Yanyar's home, and then some. 
The touch of the Anuris appears to have the same graying effect as the Yanyar's touch, but on a much more powerful scale, capable of turning things to blackness, and then nothing. As seen with Haridus, the touch of the Anuris persists long after initial contact. This similarity has driven me to make a hypothesis about the being's relationship. Perhaps the Anuris gave the Yanyar some of its power years and years ago in return for their servitude. The dozens of islands surrounding the Yanyar's home show signs of ancient ruins. Could the Yanyar have conquered these neighboring lands and brought them to their master? It seems like a plausible explanation, though since there has been no life other than the Yanyar, the Yanyuris has since resorted to devouring its servants. The once much beneficial relationship has become grimly one-sided. Zeralasp In a fitting but bitter sense, the Zeralasps will be the last entry in this storybook, as they were the last creatures of the fantastic lands at the end of the war, and the first to die out in the new beginning. Although their bodies resembled that of a swan, their skin was more attuned to that of the pearl-crested dolphins that once swam the iridescent seas to the south. Their eyes were the deepest of blue, their wings forever softly shining like fluid ivory, their mouths a smooth, toothless bill that curved ever so slightly upward. They were capable of taking a human form as well, resembling angels and awing all those they passed. As beautiful as they were intelligent, the Zeralasp were a vain and conceited race of creatures, who forever squabbled with the dragons over whose wisdom and looks were superior, and so were disliked by a great number of the fantastic land's inhabitants, for whom the dragons were born leaders and advisors. As a result, the Zeralasp secluded themselves from all other beings for nearly a millennia, constructing a citadel of their own to live apart from those they deemed inferior. They ignored all pleas for help in times of calamity, and rejected all offerings of friendship. It was not until the third awakening of the lightning-struck Titan that the Zeralasp were seen again. Vamorov's storm returned with terrifying ferocity, and the Titan rose with its strength multiplied tenfold. Half of the magician's council perished in the ensuing fight with the beast, along with nearly a hundred dragons a thousand birds, and a thousand more spirits, and still the Zeralasp refused to act. And so, the Maker himself came to the Zeralasp. His face dark with fury, his eyes normally full of compassion, brimming with icy rage. He spurned their race, accused them of being petty cowards who watched as their world burned around them. For their vanity, he cursed their citadel enchanted it, so that no Zeralasp could ever set foot in it again, then covered it in the ashes of those killed by the Titan as a reminder of the suffering the Zeralasp could have helped prevent. Overcome with despair of what they had lost and what they could have had, the Zeralasp vowed to never turn their backs on the rest of the fantastic lands again, and charged into the center of the Titan's path. Side by side with the dragons they once despised, and the master they adored, the Zeralasp beat back the beast to its mountain once again. The titan fell back into its slumber, but the grief and devastation brought about lingered for decades to come. The Zeralasp worked with renewed fervor in rebuilding to make up for all the time they had shut themselves away. They became the chief architects of the fantastic lands, and filled this world with their incredible and intricate handcraft. This lasted for another thousand years, and life prospered. And less than three decades ago, the Great War began, and all the Zeralasp had, or ever would create, was destroyed in the calamity that followed. Once again, the Maker came, but this time his eyes held only grief as he was forced to smite those who had fanned the flames of destruction. The Zeralasp desperately tried to bring back peace, but to no avail. And so they fell into despair, when the last buildings finally crumbled 
the Zeralaspa turned black from the ash and smoke. Their blue eyes turned bloody red from grief. As the surviving others filed out of the fantastic lands, the Zeralasp stayed behind, silent as the stones of their cities, and within these ruins they remain, turned to stone as the sun sets for the final time, and the world turned cold. So, there you have it, folks. The last memories that we have of SCP-1762 and the land that they come from. Wait, what the... What is that? What is this? Is this... Is this a containment breach? Tell me I'm not the only one seeing this. What does this mean? D does this mean they're back? You all seen the box materialize, right? That wasn't there whenever we came in here. It wasn't here whenever I was eating my lunch. I know that. <laughs> I swear, if this is Takanaka playing a joke, he is dead. But if he's not playing a joke, that means I'm dead. Wait a minute. They just dropped a note. Let me get that. <clears throat> oh, man. This note. It says, you didn't forget us. I guess whenever I read the book, the imagination triggered something. You know, my lectures never really end with a moral lesson, but because of all this, what the dragons have done, and for the first time in a year, I have ended a lecture with more people than I started with, Let's have a moral conclusion, shall we? And that moral conclusion is this. Never forget your loved ones. Keep them alive with your memories and your stories and your thoughts. Because if you do that, then... Then they're never truly gone. Thank you for listening. If indeed you still are. And you are all dismissed. Goodbye. So, before I thank my patrons, I have to thank SCP Containment Breach Unity. Without these guys' support, this video would not have turned out anywhere near as good as I wanted it to turn out. Especially Corvus B, who put so much effort into the musical score of this video. Without Corvus B, this video would not have sounded anywhere near as good. So, I feel like I have to have a specific shout out to Corvus in this video. I really hope you enjoyed this video because it's the most fun I've had creating a video in months. The Containment Breach Unity team are true professionals and were a joy to work with, and I really want to do it again. So leave a comment down below if you would like us to collaborate on a future SCP, because I really want to make this happen. If I were you, I would go and download SCP Containment Breach Unity and give it a try. All links will be in the description. Visit www.scp-unity for one of the best interactive SCP experiences you can find. Thanks again to everyone who helped. And now, on to my patrons. I would like to give a special thank you to the Reclusive Extrovert, James Saba, Chris Ball, Pablo Ice 917, Caleb Chaffins, Karim L. Ashmoe, Justin Day, Brockery Man, Thomas Morin, Curie Coma, White Crow, NJ Vojak, Crystal Spice, My Archive Curator Nick, King Madding, and The Wanderer. Thank you all so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated.
If you would like a special thank you at the end of each of my videos, and well, some other cool stuff as well, visit patreon.com forward slash thevolgan. Thank you.